So welcome to Adventure. Today we have Jonathan Littman, a journalist, a entrepreneur, a big thinker, and a global connector. Um, I'm so excited about this conversation today with you, Jonathan, because you can cover so much in this hour that we're going to spend having a conversation. So welcome to Adventure and a Talented Life Series. Ahmad, thank you so much. It's a great opportunity. We have a lot in common and we'll we'll get into that in the, in the chat. Absolutely. So, you know, I was I was going over your background and you have a very interesting background and and I was looking at it as someone who is engaged in education and the future of work and I looked at your background and I said, you know, you're one of these people who pretty much kind of reflects the type of individuals that we need today in the 21st century. You know, someone who uh, that, that just has um, a lot of um, different experiences embedded into um, this, this identity and this practice of, of how you show up in the world. Can you just tell me how, how did this, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how this came about? Well, maybe I'll start, uh... I have a new book we'll get to in a while, The Entrepreneur's Faces, and I'm, I consider myself a meld of the athlete type and the outsider type. Yep. And I also consider myself a Californian, uh, even more than an American, right? And uh, like you, I'm lucky to be, I grew up, I was born in San Francisco, I grew up nearby. I... I had an incredible teacher in the fifth grade who turned reading books into a competition and read a hundred books in the fifth grade. And I was also really fast for a white guy. I was like the <laughs> fastest guy in the school by far. <laughs> and she admired fast runners. So I had like this educator who admired athletic performance, which gave me this integral concept of them being connected and that there's this competitive element. And I ended up being best at a team sport, uh, the international sport of football. Oh, really? European okay. football. Yep. And that opened my mind too, because I got to play at Cal Berkeley and my best friend in the team uh, was from Kenya, phenomenal athlete. This, the other best player was Italian, right? Uh, so I, I was at a great public university, which I'm proud of, not that other private university we've heard of. In the Bay Area. <laughs> little bear, little, little bear, bear Area rivalry. I've got, I've got bear pride. And, <laughs> and so I was in this international pond from the beginning. And my father was English and really embraced America, went to Harvard, uh, rejected the East Coast as being too establishment. I'm very happy he went over the Golden Gate Bridge and decided, <laughs> I, I know where you've spent some, but he decided to stop and not go to LA for the job. <laughs> uh, and so since I had relatives in Europe, I, I was a lucky Californian who had that European experience from the age of 10. And Berkeley, you know, I almost failed at Berkeley because I was an elite athlete, not caring about my classes, and we were playing UCLA, USC, a couple other teams down south. I did not study, <laughs> and I failed my American literature uh, exam, but I got two A's the same semester in rhetoric. Oh, so that kept and, you in. <laughs> so, so it kept me in and I decided to retire from, you know, my, my non-professional athletic career. Uh, and I was lucky because San Francisco, I'm very proud of San Francisco. I think San Francisco is coming back. I was, I'm old enough that I was there at the birth of the PC revolution and we were the place where you needed communication, where all of these new publications, which were, you know, the evangelists 
for this new way of working and creating. And I was the original news editor for Macintosh Week. Really? The- so so, so did, did you know that you wanted to be a writer uh, coming out of college or is that something you stumbled into? I, you know, I was lucky to go to a very large public high school that had a good newspaper and yeah. I was the sports editor and I was a... I found out that the athletic director was stealing all the money for his baseball team. <laughs> did you do an expose on him, man? I did an expose. He was a big uh, MFer, and then he could have taken me out. And uh, but he was stealing all the money. We so I I had this. Uh, you know, later I'm proud of work I did. We get to later about around Barry Bonds for yep. Playboy and other stuff. But I had that journalistic start you know we talk about studying i practiced journalism when i was 16 so i would yeah yeah yeah. so i was writing stories editing stories you know and i didn't know for certain at cal uh, a lot of rhetoric majors went on to be lawyers or work in politics uh but it was a just a great discipline because it was something I really believe in in education. It was all about doing. We had to write tremendous numbers of papers. You know, in English classes, we'd have multiple choice exams, not in rhetoric. And we had to present in front of the class. So like one of my heroes, uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill, I learned the connection between speaking and writing and and in your presence as as individual well you know it's interesting because um rhetoric at berkeley is actually a pretty uh popular and competitive uh space um and so i can imagine you know probably if you sit down and think about the the people that that came out of that particular uh major or, or study uh, you, you would probably see some phenomenal names. I'm wondering whether whether you and Peter were there at the same time, because I know he was a rhetoric uh, major as well. But I, I, we, we don't need to go there. But I'm just I mean, maybe another half dog year or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you went into um, so you worked for PC Magazine, and that kind of you know, and it's interesting because I was one of my questions was how did you begin to kind of focus in on the tech and innovation uh, space as a, as a topic of interest? You know, I, I was lucky to be in the right place. I, while I was still at Cal, I took a course in programming, so I, I knew how to program. Honestly, I was, the minute I graduated, someone asked me to write a mini software manual. Wow. And I made my, you know, first $30 an hour, and I was <laughs> stunned. Uh, next thing I know is writing a real software manual, and I quickly segues over to writing articles, first for PC World, um, then I had a great two-year job at PC Week, uh, which was the Bible of this mm-hmm. revolution. They were in Boston, but they had a bureau here, which was in a a building where a tiny little company was uh, starting called Oracle. We didn't even know, you know, what this company was, but it was the same building we were in. So eventually I got sort of other opportunities. I found a big story and took my first big risk. So at, I'd say I was 27, I quit this great you know, budding career as a as an editor, and wrote my first book, which was really a startup. I mm-hmm. I did it on my credit card. I was what, what was the name of it? The first book was Once Upon a Time in Computer Land. Wow! And there was a chain of computer stores called Computer Land, which was the biggest chain of computer yep. stores in the world. And the founder was uh, disturbed. He was under the <laughs> uh, under Wer- Werner Erhard, one of these California cults. It was a great sort of expose, and I got public acclaim. Actually, um, 
Wozniak gave me a blurb on the cover of my book and amazing experience. So from then on, I started to be both an author and a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, through journalism, I, I used to do a lot of work in LA and I, I did huge stories for the LA Times Magazine, which was a great publication mm -hmm. and stumbled into some big stories around computer hackers. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, I had a couple movie deals and- Really? Wow, I didn't know deals. this. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a pretty heady time. And I was writing about all these crazy criminal hackers. And I had five or six years of this, you know, bizarre existence. <laughs> uh, and strangely, this is the thing I feel about life. You know, you can't plan things out. I had a big agent, uh, you know, in New York, and my name was put in, you know, the hopper to potentially collaborate with IDEO. Uh, I, well, well, you know what, Jonathan, you, you are, you know, you, you are the best. This is your business, man, because you're the best leading guy, man, that I've, uh, <laughs> I've interviewed here. So, <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so I was gonna, I was wondering, how did you make your way to um, to IDO, but before you answer that, I just want to just go back and say that um, our backgrounds are so similar in terms of, you know, going to college and being an athlete. But what what you said earlier about seeing yourself more as a Californian, I'm the same way, man. And I think that's the reason why we connect, man. I think there's yeah. there's total alignment here. So anyway, yeah, I'll leave I'll, I'll it's leave it's that. A big landmass, but but we have an affinity for this this corner of it. It's a great it's a great culture here, man. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about IDO. And I, I should tell the audience because I'm I'm realizing that I mentioned that you were an author, but I didn't really speak to you know these um, these classic. Uh, books, you know, best-selling books that you've uh, authored and co-authored, uh, one of which is The Art of Innovation, which so many people still look at that book as, you know, the source for anything around how do you think about innovation and the innovation process. So how did that, how did that love affair happen? Uh, again, there was serendipity. I, you know, had written, you know, the the fugitive game and the Watchmen, you know, criminal stories about high tech hackers, yep. which which got a lot of attention and were published all around the world. And ICM, my big agent at that time, put my name in the hopper, and there were you know half a dozen candidates, and I ended up you know winning and working with the brother of the founder. Uh, Tom Kelly, founder yep. David Kelly. It turned into a six year, you know, two book collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I was so fortunate because, you know, really I was, I was a good journalist. I, I thought I was a, a pretty good author and obviously had developed reasonable knowledge of how to write about technology and, and how to write about this sort of information revolution taking place. But IDEO was actually a different animal. IDEO was this extraordinary company, which, which has a lot of um, its roots in Stanford University. David Kelly, of course, taught there. Many of the staff came from industrial design, you yep. know, designers and architects, um, you know, interesting, you know, thinkers really. And I was there a long time ago. So when I was collaborating with them, this started in uh, 98, uh, the first time. And they have, it's almost like a college, like a liberal arts college. They have a number of sort of little studios uh, near University Avenue in Palo Alto. Uh, and David Kelly had very little ego, and he allowed them all to sort of flower and, and have their own specialties. And I got to <clears throat> attend all these brainstorms, you know, mm, wow. and, 
wow. be yeah. part of it and traveled around the world to see their other offices. And, and that's where I, my mind was open to the fact that, and this was a big thing that I'm very grateful of that, you know, it's great to be an author. It's great to be, you know, a big shot journalist, but it's a very egotistical path. Yeah. And when I got to IDEO, I saw the team, which I'd always loved as an athlete because, you know, I, I was a team player, you know, I was tight with the goalie because I was a defender, <laughs> right? And, but I never really experienced it at the same level in my professional life. And in it, at IDEO, I saw the way they'd brainstorm. I saw the way they'd share ideas. And, and they had this high level concept of diversity, which wasn't just people being diverse, but diverse ways of thinking, sure. right? And collaborating. And so exposed to that, I really, I, I'd say it, it changed me in a dramatic way. And a few years after that was when I started actually thinking about teaching, uh, which I was, I was thinking before our talk, there's one thing I, I don't like to have regrets and I don't think I really have regrets, but I do regret not teaching earlier in my life. Well, you, well, you know, Daniel Pink now has a book out on regrets. So you may, you may want to read that if you still have anything <laughs> kind of dangling around there. Uh, yeah. Uh, the only reason is because as an author, I was never told how great it is to teach. And, and, and I started to discover that when I would do seminars around innovation and then ultimately yeah. teach. But, but that was my initial connection. And in our first book, which uh, thank you for the kind words, uh, Art of Innovation. But we had such a success, they essentially demanded we do another one. <laughs> and, and the second one I equally love, which is the, the 10 faces of innovation. Yeah, I, I actually love that one too. And but the thing is, I did not know that you were the co-author on that book. For some reason, I have both of those books, but the art of innovation kind of sticks very near me. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that you were the uh, co-author until I went back and started uh, doing some background work here. Interestingly, I once again I agree with you on the teamwork thing because I had an opportunity to. Um, to connect with David Kelly. Um, I was the director of a art and technology museum in San Francisco. I, I don't know if you ever remembered Zeeum um, down in, it's in the Yerba Buena area. But anyhow, um, David, uh, he volunteered to uh, have his D school students that was just starting off uh, help develop some design tools to help us with our design process for how we went from concept to great. Yeah, it was really it was it was fantastic. And then he connected me with uh, IDO, and so I went down to IDO. And to your point about teamwork, I hung out there uh, for a couple of days. And I'm a teamwork guy too. I'm a collaborator, but it was weird because I was actually uncomfortable. <laughs> with the level of collaboration, I was like, no, it, it, are you guys just putting on a front here? You know, because <laughs> I, I couldn't believe how um, not only did they have a process for collaboration, but how earnest and open it was. And um, that that really had an impact on, on me big time. Um, so yeah, I, I can imagine what, what it was kind of- Yeah, uh, and I- uh, place there. Yeah, in, in, in my case, an interesting thing for me, which is something I carried forward to my new book, you know, with my colleague, Susanna Camp, The, yep. the Entrepreneur's Faces, is that a lot of times we're in careers or professions where there's a very traditional mindset. Um, and, and frankly, sometimes it is not collaborative, right? Yep. It, and it is very individualistic and I'd say egotistic. And, you know, I met so many people who believe that the best thing that could ever happen is you would publish a book, right? That you'd be an author. And so in my own mind, there had been this tension, why, why would I teach? Because 
you know, I'm an author. And also like, why would I collaborate? Uh, you know, journalists, especially, I, I did a lot of sort of competitive, big story, you know, over the years where there were other journalists competing for the same story, right? So you don't share, right? <laughs> so <laughs> this learning that, that you can share and it can be a beautiful thing was a wonderful discovery. Well, let's stay on this collaboration piece because, you know, I'm of the belief that, you know, we talk a lot about collaboration and, you know, it's almost become a mantra, but really people don't necessarily know how to collaborate. You know, I agree. That, <laughs> if you get them in the space, they, you know, we think that something is supposed to happen. From your experience writing uh, the art of innovation, what have what did you learn about collaboration that we could that we should all learn from as we kind of move forward um, in our in our practices? As Great question. Yeah. I, I think again, I would bring this, so my my athlete you know entrepreneurial mindset, which is that unless you're lucky to grow up in an atmosphere of collaboration, which ideally should start very young. Yep. You know? It sh should start in, you know, grade school, middle school, high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless you're lucky to, to join a ideal like enterprise, you know, the academic world is very non-collaborative in, in, in many ways. And so, I approach it like an athlete. There, there's a lot of training that has to happen. And what's different, I think, is that having been around the best athletes in the world, you know, as a, as a journalist, you can't be an average athlete, right? You have to be that athlete who, you know, to use a word we like to use at IDEO and other places, you have to cross pollinate. So you, you have to take things from other disciplines and you have to realize, you know, ultimately you're trying to build a team, right? And so you need people who aren't you. Right. And, you know, there are, there are basic building blocks we all know. Like, for instance, you know, there's the, the phrase, yes, and, yeah. right? But most people are no but, right? <laughs> and you and I, if we're at a, a, a cocktail hour, an event, we both know in about two seconds if somebody's a no but guy. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And and we probably don't have much use for them, no, right? It becomes it becomes a downer real quick. Yeah, and yeah. and so the interesting thing is, despite the startup revolution, despite technology, those things aren't necessarily design or design thinking or collaboration. So. I find, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm the senior guy now, I find that often, you know, these young minds are pretty closed, actually. Yeah. And not necessarily thinking creatively about not only opening possibilities for themselves in essentially a self-centered way, like how can I further my career? Sure. What they might bring to others in their community. Right. Oh, and, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, and I think just like we, uh, I'm gonna have you up here soon to our hub. The, uh, there's a great hub here called Shack 15. Yeah, looking forward to it. In San Francisco. And they're actually very clever. They're starting to do things like tea time and other events, which actually create rituals that encourage sort of the foundation of collaboration and community. So, so, so do, you, do you think that, you know, because you, you mentioned starting early, which is so true, you know, because collaboration is messy. And I think a lot of times the messiness and that discomfort, um, it, it drives people into this, um, into this um, self-preservation space sometime. Sure. Um, 
so do you think that we need to develop some practices around collaboration? And if so, what would be some of those kind of deliberate practices that you that you, that would be an ingredient for that? Yeah, well, we all know if you want to stay fit, you you know, you have to lift weights every yep. two to three days. Yep, yep. You, you have other days you're going to be running endurance. You're going to be working on your balance other days yep. and then the rest days. And I think that same mindset where Americans have a hard uh, time with things that aren't transactional. Yep. With things that they can't immediately point to, you know, a result, you know, a sale, you yep. know, a line of code, right? <laughs> and, and we all know that breakthrough ideas, right? And great ideas can be worth a thousand lines of code. And, and the thing is, you can't just say, okay, we're going to do a brainstorm, you know, once a quarter <laughs> on, right. on, on right. Where, where the university is going, where, where the companies are going. You know, uh, really what you need to do is twice a week at lunch, you have some cool, fun experience where there's brainstorming, and here's another radical idea. It's not, it's sometimes around something completely fun, sure. completely unrelated to a business objective. Well, you, you, you'll be surprised how uncomfortable people feel um, allowing themselves to have fun in that process. You know, it's, it's amazing to see. And the reason why I ask this is because, you know, Collaboration is such a key thing at a time where we, we live in a state of complexity. And complexity, I mean, you cannot even start to deal with complexity unless you're engaged in collaboration, you know? And it co kind of goes to what you said earlier, this whole idea around um, transactional. You know, in complexity, you have to leave room for emergence and, and people just don't feel comfortable you know, with that state. So I just think that learning how to cultivate these, these collaborative practices is um, it's so yeah. important. Actually, I'm going to have someone on to talk about that. Uh, I don't know if you know Eugene Kim, but he's, he's doing some uh, great work. I, thought, there. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, one of my models historically, I even wrote a, a little book around him is Winston Churchill. Yeah. Most people don't know that Winston Churchill uh, wrote all of his books by speaking and in he was this was technology really because you know he could speak and write quite fast and of course he was he liked having a pretty young secretary you know, <laughs> taking this all down but it was also a performance sure so he would have people to dinner he'd have a glass or two or three of wine, which would put him in the, you know, his performance enhancement uh, substance. And then he would perform part of a great work of history and he won the Nobel prize from like 10 to one in the morning. So oh, wow. people can do much more than they, they imagine, yeah. right? So he turned this and it, it gave him motivation, right? Because he was a performer, he had a very he had a very big ego, and 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 so it gave him motivation, initiative, and so forth, and it gave a routine, which was better than routine. It was a ritual, right? And 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 I like this word ritual, which is I think when we're at our best, we're collaborating with others to create new rituals. Yeah, and I'm one of these people who gain a lot of energy from from giving a little bit to someone else you know and yeah. receiving something back but i think as you get older perhaps you want to give more yeah and and i think the secret if there is one is is to do it often but uh i mentioned earlier i'm a sprinter i'm yeah. not a distance runner so I think you can do a lot of brainstorming in 20 or 30 minutes if it's done right, right? 
So a, a big message I have for people is it's better to do this two or three times a week for little bursts, mm -hmm. whatever that right time is, you know, whatever that right environment. I, I believe that no matter what your work is, there's a, there's like 10% of it or 20% that might be very creative. Sure. And then there's 80% that's getting the work done. And to me, the secret is finding out how to be in the right place framework for the creative element, because that drives the train. So speaking of sprints, so things like design sprints, these new tools, I mean, so do you, um, do you endorse those as, as, as tools to help kind of facilitate uh, the, 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 the ideation and brainstorming processes? Totally. And I, I would, I would even take it farther that you have to have your own individual. Yeah. Design sprint yeah. as, as, as a, you know, potent creative person and yeah. that I, and, and, and it can happen, you know, it can happen while you're going for a jog. It can sure. happen, you know, after you yoga. Um, and, there is a discipline aspect to it. That's where I bring the mindset of, of, of an athlete. Yeah. It's not just, oh, I want to be a brainstormer. So I think this is really cool. It's no, I, I have a notebook that's about brainstorming. You know, I read things about the topic. I learn from others and I, you know, develop my practice. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, as I've, as I've gotten more mature, um, the level of confidence that I feel in um, really designing my own processes, because I, I think early on, especially when you, you know, you go to graduate school and you go to all these different kind of, uh, you know, uh, formal institutions, you know, you're learning, you know, all of the different strategies and methods and practices. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm benefiting from how my own processes are becoming uh, my own. Like it, there, there's a self authorship that's, that's occurring. And that's, yeah. I think that's essential. It's like, mm -hmm. there is a limit to being part of a franchise, right? Yeah. So if, you, even if you went to a great university and there's some great professor and, there's only so much to being a follower. Yeah. Right? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So about innovation, and then th this should lead us right into uh, into your 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 recent book with uh, Susanna Camp, Camp um, on the faces of entrepreneurship. But with innovation, is innovation still a um, kind of foundational? component of the type of changes and transformations that we should be making in our society and business and culture for impact? And if so, is, is innovation something that is, um, is there a general term that we can embrace or should we look at kind of operationalizing that the term for our own experiences? That, those are two tough questions, but I'm going to try and try to <laughs> tackle them. Uh, you know, the, the, it's funny, the innovation term, you know, was fairly new when, when I collaborated with um, Kelly at IDEO, you know, in 99, 2000. Uh, and then it took off, right? Uh, I, I've seen plumbing trucks that are innovative plumbing trucks, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, so obviously it has become an overused term. Um, and it's interesting. I think there's a bit of a bifurcation in that clearly you can have a successful startup and a successful sort of scale up without a huge amount of innovation. If if there's a big market opportunity and there was, you know, a gap of technology or a gap in serving, you know, a, a, a very large niche customer base and so forth. So this is, you know, lean startup and, yep. and many other methodologies. So I think one of the interesting things is a lot of startups, a lot of business can be very successful without a huge 
<clears throat> amount of innovation. Sure. Not to say so, you don't have any. So, you know, I so I, I think that you know innovation still has still has a little sexy to it. I, I you're, because it's it's such a it, it is one of those words where even if you are driving down the street and you see it on a on a on a van on a plumbing van, <laughs> uh, it will make you stop and and uh, and yeah. perhaps and, think, well, you know, maybe he does something or he or right. she does something right. that's a little bit better than his. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, a layman's to me, a layman understanding for someone, you know, who's not really in startups or entrepreneurship or, or technology. To me, if someone is innovative, it's usually a degree of excellence, right? And to me, it has more scale and exponential if they found out what particular element Mm -hmm. the excellence makes mm -hmm. the greatest difference for instance you know there's some hotel chains that figured out lo and behold if they spent countless millions developing a very comfortable bed <laughs> people will pay more and stay more and you could always say what well, everyone could see that but no one really did see it all <laughs> right until quite recently. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I have another saying when I teach is that I want my students to look for what's not there. Oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah, to, to look for what's missing. And usually with most businesses, there's something missing, right? And, and, and that I think of as innovation would, would you consider that to be uh, like in your chapter the, the eye on innovation with that with that because yeah exactly yeah it's, because it's one, one anthropology of, yeah because one of the things i took from that uh, the eye on innovation piece was you know you know looking and hearing kind of having those sensories up you know I, i'm trained as a futurist um through gbn and and those guys and, you know, it reminds me of the signal, you know, um, you know, having the ability to see things that are right there as signals to um, what's plausibly going to emerge in the future. Um, is that is that something that is intuitive or is it, is this something because, you know, you talk about the art of innovation or is it something that can is it a muscle that can be developed for your, your average individual? So another great question. So of course, a big word we always talk about is empathy. Yep. So if you don't have empathy for, you know, the students, for the public, for the customers, you're not going to see anything, <laughs> right? Uh, so the question is, can you learn empathy? And, and I believe you can. Um, and I also believe some people, just like some people run faster, jump higher, some people are naturally, you know, built with the empathy, gene, sure, sure. Right? uh, and they're natural anthropologists. And, and this is one of the things I do in my workshops where mm -hmm. we have people discover, you know, their core innovation archetype. And one of which is the anthropologist. So the anthropologist is that person that we know who loves discovering new neighborhoods, right? Or loves traveling yep. and, and hates going to the same, you know, place over and over again. <laughs> so, 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 but again, I believe you can train, right? And, and there are actually, you know, in, in my workshops, we take people places and we have games that we create that help them experience that. And I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, we have to break away from, uh, from these guys, our little, little, you know, cellular phones, right? Because, you know, if you're, if you're bent over looking at a minuscule screen, <laughs> you're disconnected from seeing. Absolutely. And, and so I'm a language guy, so I see and I listen a lot. 
So I love eavesdropping and seeing how, especially foreigners and visitors are experiencing, you know, San Francisco or my new city, you know, Lisbon, Portugal. Yeah. And um, anthropology is a beautiful thing because most people would like their world to open a little bit. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, um, I consider myself sometimes on some of my social media uh, descriptions, I'll put that I'm a cool hunter, you know, okay. because that that's the anthropologist in me. I like going to places, especially when I, back in the 90s, when I was working for a large management consulting firm, and I would be in these different cities, uh, the way I spent my time away from my colleagues is that um, I would go out and cool hunt, something that was kind of underground, different, unique, uh, that would put me in a, in a place of uh, curiosity and discovery. So I, I think that that's a, a skill that we just have to cultivate, but, but really own it individually, you know? And I would, I, would, I would underline that there's been this false suggestion during, you know, the horrible pandemic that, you know, we can all just be remote robots from yeah. our apartments and houses. Yeah. And a lot of people have lost a lot of muscle tone. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They really no longer know how to see yep. or connect. Oh, that, that's that's powerful, uh, John. I mean, it's it's so true. And I and I sometimes I wonder whether that doesn't apply to me. And I'm someone who really does like to be out there that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you up to San Francisco. <laughs> so the old, hood. the old hood, man, I, I, I'm a, I, I call myself a San Francisco kid, man. Like I said, there is nothing better. And I would challenge anyone around the world to grow up in San Francisco as a kid in the seventies. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just like a playground. Um, but so let, you know, I, I talked earlier about how entrepreneurship, excuse me, how innovation has been kind of the sexy term, but it seems to have been surpassed by entrepreneurship. And so that has become, especially up where you are in the, in the whole Bay Area, Silicon Valley space. And that's, that's pretty much spread throughout the world. Now, yeah. So it, it, that has brought you to, uh, you and Susanna to write a new book. Correct. Called uh the it's the faces the entrepreneurs faces yes the entrepreneurial faces excuse me um what just tell us a little bit about that book and but we what, uh what inspired you to write it because I, i'm gonna uh, one of the things in there that i want to speak to is these archetypes which i i looked at mine and and i'm, I'm interested in having this conversation yeah uh so the books, The Entrepreneur's Faces. Susanna has an interesting background too. She was one of the original people at Wired. Yep. Also an educator, master's in education. We just got her Harvard certificate, yep. instructional design. And we were both going, in fact, she was going to more of these amazing events in San Francisco, starting about 2013, 14 through 17. And everybody was coming here. You know, and I was doing my workshops for groups from all over Europe, Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, and I'd hooked up with uh, Portuguese and Brazilians. And that's why I was working with people from Angola, Mozambique, Brazil. And we suddenly decided we knew so much about this tech hub here, but we wanted to know more how this was flowering around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So we, we went against the tide. We said, we're going to go to Europe. We went to 15 different hubs, amazing experiences in, in, in Paris, Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, Portugal was an eye opener in, in, in Lisbon. But uh, unique places like Estonia, which is, you know, one of the greatest you know, digital hubs, and it's, you know, 1.2 million people, Amsterdam, Poland. Yep. And, and we learned a lot about this, another big concept, which is ecosystems, you yep. know, 
So I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I just to jump in, I, just to make sure that we we cover this is um, as you speak about this kind of if you can define what a hub is for our audience so that yeah. they could really get so you know a hub is often a city and a hub often has components. A central component usually is one or more uh, good universities. University is usually critical with 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 good engineers and, and 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 business majors, and the reason I believe it's often is a city is because there's there's the network. Yeah, and the network is these bright young minds, but it's also people who have had an exit already from a startup. Uh, and often are addicted and are ready to jump into another one or invest in another one. It's going to be, you know, some some tech firms. So it starts to be, you know, a modern technological city that starts to sort of self-propel. And what we've seen is that there are at least 20 sort of great hubs. Yep around the world and i'm currently fascinated with the, the <laughs> connection between my great hub of my birthplace san francisco and my, my my new love which is lisbon portugal and and so going back to your earlier question what this word entrepreneur you know entrepreneurs it's a french word obviously but it's really kind of putting innovation in practice in starting a company mm -hmm. or organization to solve a problem. Whereas an innovation could be like part of a product. Sure, right? sure, sure. And, and I think this goes to the team aspect we've been talking about. So there are no like, entrepreneurs really in a garage anymore right this right is, right that's, that's, that, that's just a that's just a metaphor you we've know? moved out of the garage yep. and and an entrepreneur knows that it's such a battle yep. it's like such a season or number of seasons that you need teammates right yep. and, and and so it is contagious and you know it is a really about solving something worthwhile, hopefully. Uh, and we're starting to have many more, thankfully, entrepreneurs in the social environmental space. So you're right, it is it is hot, but I think innovation still matters. And, sure. and innovation is still core to the best startups, you know. So so in these, you know, and I've, I've often thought about this. So in these tech ecosystems, um, because I do a lot of work around cultivating talent for regional economies, you know, and really looking at ecosystems and how these things are connected. Because what, what you mentioned earlier around, um, so, you know, Silicon Valley being one of the, the, the first, you know, there was a book that was written um, years ago by Anna, Annabelle Saxanian called The Regional, Regional Advantage. And she really talked about she looked at what made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley. And so she talked about the universities and um, you know the students coming from those universities, the the funding, all those all those components and how those things ended up becoming something that later became kind of a signature for how you, you know, grow and develop um, regional economies around tech and innovation. Um, one of the things I often think about, and, and I'm interested in hearing from you because you did visit so many different hubs, is there, you know, and you have all these different moving parts inside of these, um, these ecosystems, is there an, an, an intentional identity that can reflect what a hub represents in a particular region? Um, an area is a great point. Um, you know, many countries um, in the past have, have sort of sort of said we want to be the next Silicon Valley, you know, right. the next San Francisco, which of course is not a good 
model. Yeah, I, yeah, that, yeah. And for many, for many reasons. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things that many cities and countries do well. Uh, they often um, do well in terms of the university. And, and usually there, the transition has to be, the, the university has to be more open to collaborations uh, with, with startups, with companies. Classes need to have intern internships. They need to move away from some of the academic past. Uh, like in Portugal, Universidade Nova, you know, the new university has moved faster in this direction than probably most. And then there are things the governments do. And I think that's probably where most of the improvement could come is we all know if you're starting a business, there's lots of little stupid things yeah. and governments could make them a lot easier. Like I know of people who didn't do a startup in Paris because no one would rent them an apartment. Right. You know, because they weren't French. Yeah. It was just a, a white guy from Santa Barbara and no one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, these things really matter. And Estonia is like leading with with this where, where you know, you're you're having this opening for digital nomads. Portugal has something called Startup Portugal. Obviously, there are visa programs there are there funding you know before our talk we talked a little bit i'm a believer that you know i love portuguese and i'm becoming fluent in portuguese but the language of business is english yes, so yes. almost every country would do better by having more informational infrastructure in english yeah and that's and i think that's something that well you know more particularly in europe that's that's the message that has to take place in in the southern part of Europe, you know, is um, that yes, I mean, you, you could see the benefit of the southern region there um, being rich in culture because of their their language and 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 the connection food. points there, the food, um, you know, but the English part, you know, no matter what you may critique whatever your critique may be, it is, uh, it's just a reality. Uh, it's the language of commerce. Um, so, you know, I think one of the reasons why I mentioned identity when it comes to hubs, is because you, know, you do see so many places wanting to be Silicon Valley. And sometimes I wonder how much can certain regions know what their, their, their assets are so that they can become the best in class of what they do as a region. I, I think um, that's a great point. I think, you know, focus, right? So specific cities, specific countries have more potential in specific market sectors. Um, and they need to make that more transparent. For, for instance, I have friends in Portugal who, who are American, Californian. Mm -hmm who want to bring sustainable agriculture <clears throat> to Portugal, mm -hmm. which is there can potentially be a great opportunity because Portugal is behind Spain, for instance, in terms of agricultural uh, progress and, and methodologies. But there's a lack of transparency at many levels in terms of the land in terms of you know what you can do what you can't do and these are all you know roadblocks and i think like if a city were were brilliant they would have an honest appraisal of the potential of let's say five sectors or something yep. and then really focus on that and really be open to you know constructive feedback on how they could help I, these new investors and these new entrepreneurs. I think it's critical, you know, and, and we can probably have a deeper conversation about this because I've done some work in this area where 
Um, I bought in an economic development uh, researcher. Actually, I, I, I partnered with McKinsey uh, when I was wow. working with the colleges, and we did a whole analysis of, um, of the East Bay region. And we ended up coming up with uh, five key sectors that the area could focus in on and then after we did that, we were able to bring all of the different stakeholders from public and private sector mm -hmm. and the community and really focus in on, okay, how do we develop talent in this area? How do we deal with mm -hmm. policy issues? Um, you know, how can we deal with investment? And it was a model and an approach that really allowed for leaders in the communities to really zoom in on areas that they could uh, grow and scale. And so um, I 100% I agree with you. Yeah, um, it's it's practical and yep. it's aspirational. You yeah. know, it, it gives them a real hope of not being Silicon Valley, but of being something meaningful and you know delivering jobs and, yep. and change. Absolutely. So with this with this book because which which i really enjoyed i love the stories uh in the book um you know i'm really interested in the the skill sets and capabilities of entrepreneurs and also the mythologies that we often connect to entrepreneurs like they have to be um you know this super dynamic um, you know, well-spoken individual that can just light up a room. But one of the things that your book did was to, in many ways, kind of uh, demystify by coming up with or showing how there are different archetypes that show up here. Can, can you talk a little bit about how were you able to um, to really kind of drill down and, and find that. And then what does that mean for the future of entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, we found it organically by doing a lot of journalism, by meeting tons of entrepreneurs. We started to realize, you know, it was sort of foolish to think that there's one cliche, one stereotype of an entrepreneur. And we, we believe not every startup is a tech startup, yep. right? But, yep. uh, so we started to see these archetypes and then we i knew from my past work you know with ideo that people like to get a sense of who they are and they, and, and it's empowering uh and you know we're all filled with sometimes during the day or during the weeks a little bit of self-doubt creeps in, right? absolutely absolutely uh, the imposter syndrome etc but but when if you can find that thing you know you know i'm pretty good at this like and and this goes to the team aspect so we found that it's different from you know innovation archetypes because this is really about you mm -hmm. this is about you know i endeavor to show up as the outsider athlete and then this goes to the fact that you can be more than one type it's quite possible you could be three types but for me i found a certain power in that my natural type is the athlete and throughout my life i've worked at the outsider mm -hmm. archetype and um we would meet other people like one of my favorite characters uh in the book uh i believe you know actually like joe uh, uh Bojo. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Joe is just purely through experience and dedication became a master, you know, collaborator. Sure, sure, sure. And, and I think it's really interesting to see that people can excel in completely different paths. And then again, to learn empathy for that. And so we had some like some different ones that we found interesting, which is the accidental entrepreneur and in our book this is a guy who was a brilliant physicist was never going to be <laughs> an entrepreneur 
but he decided he needed to learn, uh, you know, French. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Estonian. <laughs> and he'd do this like at midnight, borrowing the supercomputers, right? That's incredible. And, and it turns out, you know, probably 20% of startups are started by accidental entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is someone who's incredibly passionate. And because they're so passionate, and it usually starts as a hobby and a love and a pursuit. They often create something astonishing. Um, you know, another one of uh, my favorites, which is growing now, is The Guardian. Mm. And in The Guardian, these are these people who really it is the mission, right? And it's yep. whatever they're doing. It's, it's not just a business. It's not just an organization. And I think we're seeing a real growth in this around social and environmental, you know, we're seeing the world become the guardian in response to this, you know, horrible attack by Russia right now, uh, where I think it's partly because people understand that the guardian mindset, you know, rises up, right? Sure. And, and so uh, we, came up with these ideas and we found great people who would sort of be models for each one. So, so do you, so if, if an individual finds that, um, if they find their archetype uh, in the ones that you provided us with in the book, is that, should that self-awareness then lead you to uh, diversify and find other individuals that um, that may not necessarily be a reflection of you so that um, you know just as a way of kind of building a team or do you end up bringing on a bunch of the same archetype uh, as as yourself great question it's 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 the the earlier that that when you find your archetype you also become sometimes painfully aware or acutely aware <laughs> or happily aware for instance i'm i'm not the leader per se right um i'm i'm not uh necessarily the maker mm -hmm. right um and so companies usually require a mix uh, i think all companies um need an evangelist for instance all companies need a maker to actually prototype uh, you know products uh they 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 need an, a leader they they may or may not lead depending upon their their market segment a visionary mm -hmm. right uh and i think it's not cookie cutter because sure. there there's a hundred different kinds of organizations or, or startups yep. and what i advocate is as you become more aware you're going to become more aware of who people are. And I've developed a little bit of a hobby where I can pretty much identify what mm -hmm. archetype someone is. Oh, really? Really? Wow. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of fun. And um, you, when you do that, if you're trying to create something new, you realize who you should connect with and who will help you build it in a more exponential yeah. A couple more questions here, I, and thank you for your time, uh, sure. John, Jonathan. Um, well, first of all, it's interesting because I, I looked at all the different archetypes and I found I was a little bit of leader, outsider, and visionary. Great. And But I, it also, you know, just like a lot of assessments, those things can change based on your circumstances, you know? So, um, you know, because for 10 years, I you know, I was, a, you know, I was a leader, I, I led organizations. But when I led those organizations, I was never a status quo leader. I was always someone who was uh, visionary, kind of had an outsider um, uh, mindset. And, you know, th there's, there's good and unfortunate news with that. Um, <laughs> you know, one is that, you know, your, your shelf life has a tendency to be uh, <laughs> shorter um, even though you get a lot of things done, but you could have a short shelf life, uh, meaning that usually when I'm in, when I go inside of an uh, organization for leadership, 
I'm brought there to lead change or to do transformation. And what I realized is that after about three to four years, uh, everyone appreciated it, but then they get tired of me. They're like, okay, we're, we're tired of transforming. We, we want to settle down a little bit and like, you know, and so th those are things I learned about myself. But the reason why I bring that up is because um, even though entrepreneurship is really huge and an integral part of our, um, our economy and our society now, uh, everyone's not going to join a startup. And so what you find is, is that there's this term called um, the institutional entrepreneur, meaning that you have individuals inside of these large organizations that mm -hmm. want to, you know, want that have a, an entrepreneurial mindset, but they find themselves either isolated or haven't developed the practices inside of that space because they don't have kind of the freedom that they would uh, have if they were outside of that space. What, what, what do you say to those type of institutional entrepreneurs? How can we cultivate? Yeah, well, actually in our book, um, you know, we, we often use the related term entrepreneur. There you go. Yeah. And, and, and Joe Biogio, he, you know, he worked for, you know, he worked for IBM, he worked for Microsoft, he worked for Capgemini. The, these are all giants, multinational, yep. not always the most entrepreneurial. <laughs> right. uh, but he was able to collaborate and create programs to bring uh, a level of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. initiative. I think you said something important, which is that, you know, especially big animals, big elephants, right? They're not going to change direction, no. as much, right? And and they may assassinate you along the way. <laughs> they may step on you. And yeah. yeah. Uh, you're just an insect. <laughs> uh, but 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 uh, but I do think the better big organizations have sort of pockets of less resistance, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if, if anything, our, our, our archetypes can help you discover sort of which mindsets, because that's what really they are. So mm -hmm. which mindsets or collection of mindsets might have a higher degree of success in a pocket of a big company? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all know there are people who really like to say no, but we do things differently here and no, thank you. Yeah. Right. And so, and, and I think, you know, with your, you know, far greater corporate experience that, you know, you have to be strategic, you know, people can be walls, right. And, and the right entry points in the right partner and the right sharing of, some you know credit and so forth it's, uh, it, it, it's a very skillful process and and actually um i didn't necessarily you know i changed my approach i had to go out and get training um i thank goodness i you know i'll, I'll give a plug to to harvard's adaptive leadership program uh, mm -hmm. that they have there that really helped me uh, understand how the ideal of being kind of a leader and outsider, um, leaders and outsi outsiders have a tendency to be assassinated, right? So you, you, <laughs> so you have to know how to skillfully engage. And, and part of it is, is, is not to allow yourself to be on the outside by yourself. You know that that and how do you manage that? There's process? a danger in being a, a lone rebel. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so that's been great. So you know, we're we're both educators, um, and you know, education is huge for me, uh, especially around cultivating talent. Um, but our universities and our educational systems are failing to meet the challenge of. Um, developing the the right platforms to help cultivate talent for the future of work and impact, you know, for for people, um, for incumbent people, and for some of our young people that are coming out. 
I know you've been engaged in different types of learning uh, systems. How, how do you see this thing playing out in terms of supporting talent? Um, um, and what type of entrepreneurial skills that you think people yeah, I mean, benefit from? Actually, yesterday, Suzanne and I were teaching the doctoral fellows at UCSF. It's one of the, it's one of the top two medical schools in the world here. We're teaching them really how to pitch, how to, how to present their... Uh, my father died of lung cancer. They're fighting big tobacco and evil e-cigarette mm -hmm. conglomerates. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I find, again, I go back to my athlete, there's a lot of tools like Every student should be learning how to present and pitch starting at 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we shouldn't wait till you're 25. So I think we, we need to have, you know, the fundamentals of being entrepreneurial taught in middle school and in high school. And I love to see, you know, you went to a great high school, uh, St. Ignatius there in, in San Francisco. I'd like to see high schools really embrace this because I think we, then we'll find that so much more is possible, right? When the kids are coming into college with all these, with all these skills. I also know a lot of young entrepreneurs who bring on um, interns who, again, are 15, sure. 16. I mean, that's not kidding. Their, their minds are, are, are strong. They have the energy. They have the enthusiasm. I think, you know, when we find things that young people care about, like whether it's a social, environmental cause, whether... It's an L, a, a kind of business, you know, whether they're they're fascinated by food or they're, they're fascinated um, by games, whatever. We forget that like motivation is 95% of achievement. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I'm I'm a real believer in being creative about finding motivations and that good things will will come Intrin intrinsic motivation yeah not money not giving kids uh, mcdonald's after they win the ball game right? <laughs> <laughs> uh you know and, and 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 there's a beautiful thing which is there are so many startups there are so many new kinds of enterprises that can benefit by this this potential talent, which can be either free or low cost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And have mutual benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think a lowering of sort of, you know, in, in, in liberalizing what is work in a class, right? So much of work in a class is just wasted rote yeah. repetition. And we both know that once you go to a good school, you got no one's going to care if you've got a 3.3 or a 3.5 or a 3.6, right? <laughs> hey, and, and thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I uh, but I'm I'm very you know I I like teaching in new modes, you know, and I, I prefer uh, uh, in person, right? But I've, but I've learned certain things from teaching digitally the, the last couple of years. What, what, what are some of your core topics that you teach? Well, we, we always teach experiential innovation yep. um, workshops yep. where, you know, we've done this in Paris, Portugal, San Francisco, other cities where we find a physical place where they can do an immersion and learn this, you know, innovation begins with an eye mm -hmm. and, and then hopefully cross pollinate new ideas that they would have never thought of to, you know, education or yep. whatever industry. Um, been doing a lot more around uh, pitching, uh, presenting, mm -hmm. speaking. I, I feel like we're going to do much more there because you know, with my background in rhetoric sure, sure. Um, uh, and 
and I think we're we're always presenting. We're micro presenting, you know, even if it's a one minute meeting at a, a networking event. Mm -hmm. uh, and and these things generally don't exist in universities. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap it up because I think you really nailed it when it comes to um, learning experiences and how those things should play out. The, the whole idea around, you know, bringing, and that's, that's another thing that we have in common. I know that's, a, that's one thing that Susanna Comp, you know, your co-author and I have in common. It's my, my background is actually in learning design as well, mm -hmm. is, you know, bringing more experiential uh, learning you know, what, um, you know, <laughs> once again, my favorite job ever was when I was the director of a museum. Wow. You know, because um, it was all experiential. And because we were working with tech, we wanted to make technology invisible, mm. you know, so that you know, the, the, the ubiquitous experiences of focusing in on story and, and engagement became the key part of how those students developed, you know? And so um, I love it, man, this is great. But Jonathan, I, I, wanna, I wanna say thank you. First, so where can people reach you and, um, yeah, yeah, they, you know, both Suzanne and I are easily found. We'll reply on LinkedIn. You, you know, it's it's Jonathan Littman, two L's, M-A-N, Susanna Camp, just like a summer camp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my book with Susanna's The Entrepreneur's Faces. There's actually, she created a cool little quiz to get a sense An of your, yeah. your, your assessment there, you know, and uh, thankfully my books are still available of uh, with audio art yeah. innovation 10 phases of innovation oh, you're still you're still eating off of that man that's great <laughs> and if, if you're in san francisco come by shack 15 that's that's my other house up there well, john i once again this has been fantastic i've been wanting to uh do this for a long time so i just want to say thank you for giving me just a really a nice chunk of your your day and your time so well it's been uh, it's been an honor and i i i'm more passionate about education every day yep. and i love the fact that you're pushing in you know creative new entrepreneurial ways and internationally as well absolutely uh and we will hook up again in lisbon i know this absolutely <laughs>